So, I find this film, this film franchise, fairly unique in the fact that most franchises, especially for anime, don't have the same director across all the films. Yeah. So, what what made you guys so dedicated to this the story? Well, you know, the the first movie was a little bit of a sprint to the finish, and uh, Chris Sanders and I had come on pretty late in the game. Jay had already been cast, had had most of the cast was in place. And so we had to reconfigure it with very little time. Um, and at the end, when they when it was a success and they wanted to make another, I just uh, I pitched the idea that maybe we do a trilogy because then we could do three acts of one story and give it purpose and you know a sense a sense of importance instead of kind of a, a random nest, next adventure with the same five or six right. characters. What about you, Jay? You've played the character across TV too, which is exceedingly rare. Yeah, yeah. So for you, what was what what keeps you dedicated to the character? Oh, I guess I, I fell ass backwards into the most important character I'll, I'll ever play. Uh, um, you know, I, this is three movies and seven or eight years of t the TV show, and um, and yeah, it's 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 a special special thing that you know you. You can have very sort of humble beginnings into something that turns into uh, something that's like real profound in, in, in your life. And, you know, it was just an audition I went on, right? And then I got the job. And I certainly didn't think, like, you know, when I, when I went into a recording, station, a recording session in, in, in Hawaii when I was 26, I did not, like, predict that I'd be talking about the third <laughs> movie at TIFF, you know. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's massive. Um, I, I I've said it before, but it's just like, you know, I I feel like uh, the luckiest kid in the world because all I have to do is like say a bunch of lines like four times a year <laughs> for three years, and then and then they're like, okay, here come to the premiere, <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, this thing's neat, you know, and. And it's just, and, and, you know, I got the chance to, to play him on TV as well. And I just thought, like, you know, uh, for whatever reason, that's not typically a thing. Right. Um, and, and I, like, and, 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 and it's not like as a kid I wasn't aware of that, you know. As a kid even, I would be able to tell this is the TV Kermit. No, Kermit's a bad example. But anyway, you know, <laughs> my meaning is uh, I, I, I would be able to tell. And, and I thought, you know, it's kind of neat if kids, if it's all cohesive and, and part of one thing. Kind of like Optimus Prime. I mean, exactly. that's what I think of for the odd continuity yeah. that he did the movies, he did everything. It does end up making kind of a bit of a difference, yeah. you know. And, um, and uh, really the, the big takeaway, the legacy for me is how many people my age or older come up to me and say, like, I hate your voice because I hear it all the time in my living room or in my car. <laughs> <laughs> it's like... <laughs> That's an amazing curse. I mean, yeah, yeah. It is. It's, I think you it's know, wonderful. Look, my voice is a big ask when, when it's, like, not being played 400 times on people, you know. But, uh, uh, you know, but, uh, but I, I... Look, the, the, there, are, there are worse... Worse crosses to bear than than being uh, you know uh, the voice of an iconic character. Well, you have said, and I don't know if you'll agree, but I, I would expect it that this is the best of the three. That that's what you've said so far. Yeah. First of all, how do you reach that point? Is it because you've had ideas coming forward throughout the series, and otherwise, what do you think makes it the best? And well, I actually, I'd ask that of both of you actually. I would say for me, uh, it's the realization of the ambition behind the trilogy. Because the, the woman who wrote the books upon which these movies are, are rather loosely based uh, is named Cressida Cowell. She came to visit us during the first movie as we were wrapping it up. And at the time, she was writing the last book in her book series. And the ambition of it was to explain what happened to dragons and why they are no more. And I thought like that was Im immediately gripping and emotional. And it made me recall the opening line of her first book, which was Hiccup as an adult reflecting back, saying, there were dragons when I was a boy. And I just thought, wow, that's a gutsy ambition. You know, if we could take this, this, this pair, Toothless and Hiccup, and take the audience on a journey toward separation, 
and have them go along with us and not only support it but kind of could reach that conclusion emotionally themselves that you know that that could stand the test of time that could be a film that might fit on the same shelf with you know ET and Born Free and other classics where you have characters that are that are brought together for a moment in time and have such an impact on one another's lives but eventually must go separate ways uh, fox and the hound right yeah right yeah the ones that stick with you that's the, that's it that's that that's the, the ones that stick with you because they they have the sort of uh, the, the weight of, of importance and not importance for importance sake you know and I, and I think because I think like I think kids especially have pretty good uh, BS detectors and they can you know and, and you can tell when some when a story is just doing busy work you know when it uses when the music tells you something's impactful and and ever and the characterizations do everything does but the story and 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 I and so I think that like this is the best one for a bunch of reasons um, not the least of which is it will be one that lingers in people's minds the most after they see it. And, and that is with a full understanding of how important and beautiful the first two movies are. Um, th this one will connect to people in, in such a deep way, but I, I also think, in, strangely, uh, it is in a lot of ways the least sad of the trilogy, uh, which is like, you know, while also being kind of super sad too. Uh, but it's a How to Train Your Dragon movie. It wouldn't be that if there wasn't any melancholy. Well, for for this franchise, the that melancholy mix of it, like it's almost honesty. I mean, for mm. me, it's more honest than most kids' movies. How do you guys come up with that kind of, I guess, storytelling that that doesn't speak down to kids? I mean, is it easy, or do you actually have to work at how you present that? I think we all take the same attitude in making the movie, which is we're, we're trying to make a movie that we want to see. We're not making a movie for kids. We're just making a movie that doesn't exclude kids. Right. Uh, so it, it has to check every sort of emotional and thrill box for us as moviegoers. And we take it very seriously. We make, we make the film as though it's a live action movie. It's just made in an animated medium. Yeah, and it's like I think Dean is a great example of like you know, um, the, the, the world's greatest artists, I think, um, uh, are, are, are cynical but haven't let that dictate everything. You know, you, 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 ha you can't be a buffoon. You have to be aware of what the world is like and, and what human nature is. However, if you don't get excited in the same way that you got excited about stuff when you were little, you know, then, then I then I think you've kind of uh, missed the point of the whole thing. And now I, I definitely said that this is a virtue that all the world's greatest great artists have in common. Um, I I also do. I would not put myself in that place. But but I like I when I when I geek out on stuff or when I'm excited about stuff, I react exactly the same way that I did when I was little. And right. and it's something that I have worked to keep. Especially, you know, working kind of in movies and TV where you see how the sausage gets made, it can kind of take a lot of the magic away. Um, but I refuse to have that happen because if if there if that magic is gone, then I might as well just work doing something else. Right. And and so I think that like that's that's how you make something that's for kids without it being only for them. And 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 sort of talking down to them is that you're making it like Dean, Dean said you make it for yourself but you the, yourself you just have one foot in childhood the, the whole time yeah Jay Jay paid me I think the best compliment I've had on the movie and it was early on he read an early draft of the script and he uh, he said it's so so 80s in the best way <laughs> which which is exactly what he's talking about it, like, it, it touches upon something those those movies those stories that kind of shaped us as people who are making movies today uh, it, you know, it's always driven by what we got excited about. It's the reason why, why we're doing what we do. That's it. That's it. My fondest memories cool. are like, you know, my mom or dad bringing home movies from the video store um, in, in that particular era and just like having my imagination hijacked and then going to the video store itself and getting lost in the posters, let alone the movies themselves. And so like, it has, it has such a wonderful sense of, uh, one, of, of awe 
and magic and wonder. Um, and that's something that for whatever reason um, is kind of gone to the wayside and, and you know awe and wonder seem quite quaint to a lot of <laughs> modern filmmakers um, mm -hmm. and then they wonder why nobody cares about their movies. Mm -hmm. Well, last two last questions quickly. One is what can you tell us about this last film for starters? Is there any little snippet that you You're can familiar tease? with the Ir Iran Contra saga? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll we'll start with, you know, Oliver North is a big, is, is sort of Dean's spirit. <laughs> um, what can, yeah, yeah, I'll leave that to you. I well, it, it takes place a year after the events of Dragon 2, Dragon 2, so we've got Toothless as the alpha of all dragons, we have Hiccup as the, uh, the rookie chief of the Burkean Viking tribe, and uh, they have been busy rescuing dragons and bringing them back to their very overcrowded home island of Burke, which is attracting a lot of attention from their enemies and infuriating them. And so they they hire uh, they hire a specialist. They hire the guy who's responsible for having wiped out all of the Night Furies to come in and extract Toothless and thereby extract the entire dragon army because they will follow their alpha. Uh, it's pressure that's put upon Hiccup to really delve into his past and uh, revisit in a, an old myth, an old sailor's myth, that his father told him about a hidden world, a place where dragons originate from. And should it be real, uh, it could be their way of disappearing off the map and maintaining their, their peaceful way of life, so they embark on a quest to find it. Uh, it brings about many discoveries with new characters and new lands, and uh, a lot of conflict, and ultimately uh, a, an emotional transformation for Hiccup. Who, uh, whose every success is is the result of his relationship with Toothless, and this movie really kind of brings that to the table uh, as Toothless is answering his own call of the wild. Um, it forces Hiccup to confront that insecurity in himself and really bring to the test his ability to be a, not only a, an effective leader but um, a, a fully rounded person. Amazing. Well, last quick thing. I heard that you temp in for his voice before he comes in. <laughs> is yes, there any yes, chance yes, yes, you can yes, give yes. us a sample? Oh, God, no. No, no, no. Yeah, I'd love to hear it. I don't even attempt to do Jay's voice. I just try to get the emotional quality of it okay. in the ballpark. Because I'm going to tell you something about Jay's performance. He downplays it, but he carries the entire trilogy. And certainly this movie, I mean, we've recorded him more than we've recorded anyone else simply because he's the pivotal character. He's the one that the audience experiences the story through. Right. But at this point, Jay knows Hiccup better than, than I know him, than anyone knows him. So he's self-directed. And uh, <laughs> we, can, we, we can do all of our recording sessions remotely with me in L.A. and him in Toronto. That's cool. Because I don't have to really say anything. I'll say, Jay, could you just, and I got it. And he just keeps <laughs> going until he'll land it every time. So, uh, and if he, if he doesn't agree with the line, he knows the character well enough to know he wouldn't say that or he wouldn't say it in that way. Which is, you know, that's the kind of collaborator you hope for. That's very nice of him to say. That's, that's, yeah, that's awesome. I, um, yeah, I, yeah, that's really, very nice of you to say. Well, thank you both very much. Really a pleasure chatting. Thank you for having us.